All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the March 2023 Ask Me Anything. Happy to have you on board. If you're watching this in the future, hi. How you doing? Um, if you're in the room now, hi. How you doing? Uh, it's good to have you here. And I'm excited to talk about some things I've learned. But if you haven't been here before, one thing I like to do is to ask people what they've learned before we get started. So what's one thing you've learned this month? Four minutes, we'll do the music and type away.
right. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. There's some really good conversations in the chat, and I am thankful uh, for you all trusting me with them. It's interesting. One of the conversations in the chat talked about getting work done. And one thing I've been thinking a lot about this month and reading about this month uh, is how work gets done. Not just a project, but a collection of projects. How do portfolios move forward? And I think the one thing, if you wanted to simplify successful portfolios, that can innovate and do good things versus those that are stuck in the mud, I think it boils down to limited work in progress. And limiting that work in progress is critical. Um, it's a marker for strategy and vision. Strategy is about decision-making. If you can't simplify and make choices, you don't have strategy. And so this is one of the markers where limited work in progress can tell you a lot about a company because if you have space to think, then you have space to decide. And if you have space to decide, then you're probably going to be making a better product than a team that doesn't. And so one of the ways to think about limiting work in progress is to A, have a strategy or vision. If you have a strategy or vision and people have agreed on it, then there's an opportunity to say, this is the language uh, that we're going to use. And we need to limit work in progress so we can get the important things that are on this vision, the important things that are on this strategy done. Next, uh, limited work in progress uh, definitely tells me if you're dealing with fires. Uh, if you have a lot of work in progress, then I'm gonna guess that you have a lot of fires. It's one of those things that kind of go neck and neck. If you have one of this, you probably have that. And so if you're shipping with a lot of fires, you got to ask yourself one or two things. One, is it worth putting them out? And so what that means is, are is it worth uh, spending the time and resource to go and stop? to stop the fire. That's a conscious choice. The other conscious choice is to let the fire burn out. You don't have to fix everything. Sometimes it's just worth letting something go and being very conscious about letting that go so you can focus on the things that matter. And so it's a good opportunity to sit with your team and ask them about fires that you see, things that you've noticed over a long time period, let's make a decision here. Are we going to deal with this fire or are we going to let it burn? Let's make a choice. And then lastly, thinking about work in progress is it's additive nature to complexity. Our complexity, both strategically and what I mean by strategic complexity, um, and maybe I'll talk about this in another month, because it's, it's certainly something that's worth spending a lot of time talking about and, and getting into. But in short, strategic complexity is the idea of uh, how are we going to get, what is the complexity of us achieving the bets that we have set out on our strategy, right? What how complicated is it going to be? And so uh, whenever you release something, think about the first two things I talked about. One, you have to understand how it affects your strategy or vision. And two, that thing is going to create fires because every release creates fires. It may not be now, but it will in the future. And so it's really important that you think about building, but you also think about removing, right? And if with, with limited work in progress, you have space to think about that removal. You have the space to think about making decisions. 
because everything you build without removing leaves rubble, you have to decide, are we going to remove that rubble or are we not? <clears throat> The implication here is if you cannot limit your work in progress, you will be unable to build things eventually. You're going to find yourself in quicksand and you cannot struggle out of quicksand. It's going to make you sink further. And so the opportunity, I think one of the things that you can do tomorrow is to ask yourself about one, what is our strategy? What is our vision? And how does it how does it work with the work that we have in progress? Literally taking what you have and putting it into these buckets. It can give you an idea of what are we doing that's tied to strategy and what are we doing that's not tied to strategy? Be very judicious about it. Two, have a conversation with your team about the fires that are currently happening. Are you... Uh, are they worth putting out? Are they worth letting them smolder? What is the contagion? Right? I, you know, are these fires going to have to be? Do, do we have to act on these? Um, or is something bad going to happen? And third, what are you removing? It doesn't necessarily have to be one-to-one. -one. I think really good teams can get to a place where it's close to one-to-one, -one, right? We build something, we remove something. But think about what you can remove. Even if it's just one thing this quarter um, or next quarter, right, is, is a lot of teams are going into a new quarter. It's an opportunity to think about how we can remove something to open up the possibilities of other things. And right, and if you're too busy building new things, you do not have the space to think about that, right? Because you're too busy trying to chase after something. You can't struggle out of quicksand. And so, four minutes, let's talk about what those thoughts bring out of you. Um, comments, questions, we're in the chat. See you in there.
we are back. Yeah. I... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're back. We're back. I'm loving the chat right now. Because, yeah, it takes effort. And, and you know, the quicksand thing is something I thought about because, you know, with teams, work can feel very constricting. Like it can feel like it, it you know, it, it kind of covers up. It just wraps you up. And so um, very similar to quicksand, even though underneath quicksand, it's water. It seems like it's something you should be able to to maneuver in. It's work. You make the choice, but we end up where we end up uh, as a result. Let's talk about the ABT framework. Speaking of communication, this is something that I've been really into. Lately, I've been throwing it into my presentations uh, because I find it very easy. I don't have to add anything to it. It's very easy to use. And it starts to create a three-act structure that you can take whatever you're learning, whatever you're doing, and you could just throw it in there. It also forces you to uh, take a second and ask yourself a couple of questions based on the three parts of the framework. And so... I want to talk about that framework uh, right now. So the framework is pretty simple, right? ABT, which stands for and, but, therefore. And I break it down into these three parts, right? It breaks down into these three parts. And, which is the journey. What is our objective? What are we trying to do? Act one. But... Hard part. What's the hard part? What's the villain? Act two. Therefore, action. What do we have to do? Act three. Right? Um, thesis, anti antithesis, synthesis. It's all there in this quick three things. And so let me give you an example on how it can work. Um and I'll give you two while, while we're talking. Let's say you have a, a strategy and you're trying to communicate where the strategy is at any given point in time. Now, what I tend to watch people do is they create this large document that has all the information, the assets, the artifacts, the this, the that, and no one's reading it. Of course, no one's reading it. Who wants to read a book on top of going to work. That is what we do when we send people huge spreadsheets or when we send people huge documents or when we send people large uh, presentations. You're asking them to read a book at work while they have work to do. And so this works as a really simple way of doing it the other way. So, which is giving them something that they can hold on to, a story. So you can frame the strategy as, we're trying to do this and that. But um, problem X is in front of us. This is the current problem that we're facing. So we're trying to do this and that, but this current problem in front of us is stopping us from making this happen. And then you could say, therefore, we're going to do one, two, and three. So putting that all together, it's, we're trying to do this and that, but our current problem is stopping us from achieving it. Therefore, we need to try one, two, and three. And so as a mechanism to figure out what your next few steps are and to put it in context, it's a really simple way of doing that. The other thing that I find super helpful is to create OKRs or particularly objectives. Think about what we just said, right? Um, we could talk about what our strategic objectives are. We can put that in the and space. We could talk about the problems that we're, we're trying to solve. We could put that in the but space. And then all of a sudden, therefore, becomes our objective, right? What's our short-term objective? We need to do, we have these strategic objectives of this and that. 
but this problem is in front of us. Therefore, I want to do this objective and I want to tie this to these KRs. Again, very easy to come up with a story that you can go to people and talk to them about in a way that they understand, which is a way better than giving them a huge document. Also for yourself, it's great because it allows you to ask yourself, where are the questions, where are the, where are the, where are the flaws here? What, what's, what am I missing? Right. Do I feel confident in the problem? Is that clear? Right. Cause if I can't boil it down into, you know, a sentence or a few, then I need to go back and think about the problem more. Um, do I know what's in front, in front of me? What are we trying to get to? Uh, do I know what resources we have available? You can start asking yourself these questions to help tighten up the story uh, to deliver. And so the implication here is uh, turning something into a story is way simpler than giving people a big document. And then also it allows you the flexibility to turn it into different things. That You can turn that framework into a slide. You can turn that into a video. You can turn that into a uh, one sheet. You can turn that into whatever medium that makes sense. And while you're doing it, you're going to increase trust because people are going to feel like if you have a story, you know what you're talking about versus if you're just handing them a big old thing, right? They, they're they're going to, they're going to tune out eventually. And so, uh, you know, the vibe, four minutes, questions, comments, however you feel, go ahead and put them in the chat.
here for the last bit which for me is translating um over the last month i spent some time in mexico and had to speak spanish a lot um i'm really bad at speaking spanish and it took me some time to like one get into a place where i was able to comprehend it because like i've studied spanish but I was in a place where, you know, it's different from reading it or doing Duolingo and and trying to, you know, facilitate it to hearing it on a regular basis, plus in a way that people speak it regularly. Um, and so that was that was some time, and I I had to humble myself very much in in terms of trying to understand and speak, uh, in a language that I didn't quite grasp, I didn't quite know. Um, as well. And so I had to deal with a change in language, which meant saying things slow um, and asking people to like repeat themselves, which felt embarrassing. I felt really bad about that. Um, I had to strain to listen, making me needing to hear things, um, which reminds me of the work that we do as product people um, we tend to, we can be in a place where we say things that people don't understand. And so do we slow down? Not really. There's an opportunity to really try to understand if people know what you're saying. And so that was helpful for me in a communication point of view. Next was losing the command of language. I couldn't joke anymore. I love joking. I love, uh, teasing. I like having fun. Um, I couldn't make jokes. I had to talk slow and, and, and message. And another thing that, that brought to me is like, if people aren't joking, if people aren't, you know, having fun with the communication that you're having, if they're not, you know, emoting or doing different ways or, or, or joining in, if they're just trying to hold on, then you have an opportunity to slow down and, and bring the conversation back to a place where they can be comfortable and build from there. And then lastly, it's the kindness. Everybody was so kind and uh, people were always willing to uh, help me figure things out. And this was a reminder that people are kind. Uh, there are opportunities to, people are, are always willing to help you if you ask are generally willing to help you if you ask. And so uh, in a bad, it's not a bad thing to stop and say, hey, did you get that? Or if you're listening to somebody else and you're trying to translate, say an engineer or a salesperson, go, hey, um, I'm trying to understand this. Could you help me figure that out? And thinking of back on my career generally, I tend to get... Um, positive feedback when whenever that happens. And I end up understanding things moving forward. And so the implication here is, um, hey, no one knows what we're talking about most of the time. Um, and maybe this goes back to the work in progress thing, but I think very similarly, uh, there's an opportunity to slow down our language and to talk in a way that people get. And to speak in a way that people understand requires us to slow down Look for uh, look for signs of command of the language. Look for signs that people are engaging. Are they laughing? Are they are they uh, angry? Do they have some like are they are they doing stuff with the words that you're telling them instead of just trying to hold on and understand? Uh, and make space and time for people to talk or ask questions or if you 
can be the first person to say, I don't understand that. Could you please help me? And if we do that more, you'll come out of it better. And I mean, I left Mexico being able to confidently order food or and confidently uh, ask for directions and confidently, um, you know, I confidently made strides uh, simply because I took the opportunity to um, focus and 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 uh, immerse myself in in the language. And so there's an opportunity for us as product people to do the same. Let's talk about it. Four minutes.
All right. So there's a Q and A. There's a few questions that came in. Um, I gotta find them. But there are a few questions that came in. Uh, from folks. Um. And there are a few questions here. If anybody here wants to to pose a question, throw it in. We'll we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, <clears throat> so some of the questions that came in, Eduardo asked two questions. How do you bring focus when you are in a pre-product market fit? So Eduardo goes and continues to talk about how um, you know, we're, we're joining an early, he joined an early stage startup. We're launching ad campaigns and doing all this stuff. Um, and I, I hate to tell him, but you know, all that stuff is, is really for naught. Um, what do you do when you don't have product market fit? Well, you go find product market fit. And that means that you need to, uh, you would scrap, I would scrap the ad campaigns. That's just burning money. If you don't know what you're doing and who you're doing it for, why are you launching ads? Right. This is one of the things that I, I feel like is one of the mis, un, misunderstood things that startups do is they they focus on things like ads because it's a short, um, it's a short-term win. When somebody pays for ads and you start to see movement. You, you go, oh, okay, right, people are responding, but are they buying? Probably not. Um, how much are you spending versus how much are you bringing in? You're probably burning almost all of that money. Far more useful to take the, uh, take the problems that you think people have and go talk to your potential customers and start to understand who they are and what they do. And from there, what you what you end up understanding is you end up understanding uh, just how good your problem is and if you should invest more to it. Um, and so pre-market product market fit means you need to spend all of your time on problem determination, all of your time understanding your users, all of your time doing experiments, doing, um, working with your teams to uh, create MVPs or prototypes to put in front of people and to test, 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 right? Um, finding things that work is pretty funny because once you do it, you will understand, like, I don't need to tell you the signs for somebody to be really into something. When you see it as you're, as you're doing this work, you'll know, right? People will start clamoring. People start saying, how can they pay today? People will start saying, um, you know, I'd love to tell my friends about this. And you'll, you'll get these answers unprovoked. And so I would cut all the ad stuff. I would cut all that. Um, he was talking about doing ads and, and writing ads and creating content. I'd cut all that. I would just focus on the interviews. I would focus on bringing the engineers in. I would focus on trying stuff, building things with them. Um, and I would be really focused. I would start thinking about what our strategy and vision is going to be based on the responses that I got. That's plenty of work. And, um, you know, it'll take your time. Uh, but you, you, you shouldn't be overwhelmed, right? Overwhelm is coming from doing these extra things like websites and Webflow and, and ad campaigns. These are things to keep yourself busy so you don't have to sit in the silence. Get comfortable sitting in the silence. Um, it's talking about the CEO wants a yearly roadmap. Uh, also, I, I so when it comes to that, I would just put the question back on the CEO. Why do you want a yearly roadmap? What does it do for you? Um, because 
there might be something else at play. And so we got to figure that out. What is what is the yearly roadmap? Because quite clearly, you don't have a product. You don't have something that um, people want yet. So are you building? You're going to spend a year planning on building for a product you don't know if people want? So what's behind that question? It's worth sitting there and talking. Maybe there's a, a thing for VCs. Maybe he's trying to bring someone in and he has to show them that they has a year roadmap. Maybe like, but I think at the core, you want to understand what's behind that question because then you can start to change what that, what does, what does roadmap mean to that CEO? Um, I think there's an opportunity for you to get behind what his assumptions are or what her assumptions are and figure out from there how you want to move forward. Because the idea of, as you say, like there's no there's no product market fit, there's no understanding, but you want a year, a roadmap out for a year, doesn't make sense. If it's a feature-based roadmap, um, are there question, are the roadmaps questions that you're ponder or where you're going to put your energy or, or kind of what areas? Maybe that could fit a bit more. Who knows? But again, it's worth spending some time to understand what the assumptions, underlying assumptions are. What is a roadmap to them? What does it mean? Who is it for? Right? Because you don't have customers. So it's not for customers. Like, who is it for? Why do you need it? And then kind of build that conversation from there. And with that, um, if there are no more questions, would love to see you. If you're watching this in the future, um, go ahead and send a nice little comment or, or, or um, tell me, ask me a question. I'll be happy to answer that. Or send me an email, adam at theadamthomas.com. More than happy to chat. Um, you can also book office hours. Uh, if you go to my website, www.theadamthomas.com, feel free to book some time with me to just talk about whatever's top of mind with you. That's how I do these AMAs is to reach out to everyone. So um, with that, I want to thank you uh, for joining me. I want to thank those who are watching this in the future for hanging out and uh, we'll talk soon. Have a good one.